this uh, American Savage garage and just give you a sense of why uh, I'm doing what I'm doing here. It is a quite a kind of a hard lesson. If I bought an old 1988 um, Harley Davidson and went in one day and I was in another state, a few states away actually, and I <clears throat> wanted to get something minor done to it so I could get it back home <clears throat> and uh, shop wouldn't work on it too old um, we're finding this all over the place uh, not just in motorcycles though to be honest with you it's happening all over the place in what you would call any older vehicle that is not in um, a dealership it used to be you could take anything to a dealership if you wanted to and <clears throat> get something worked on but even more so even the independent shops <clears throat> who would work on anything uh, back in the day they would uh, they would work on cars and do what you wanted so to speak you know and do what you needed to to get it back up and running on the road <clears throat> so when I bought my 1984 I had another issue just one small thing I don't have a lift so I wanted something something done so I could you know sort of progress on and uh, the shop told me yeah we don't work on cars that old and I said well how old do you work on cars and he said you know till about 2000 so anything older than 2000 they can't work on <laughs> it's like why do you do that and he said we don't know how we don't know how to work on old cars we don't have the knowledge now whether you believe that or not <clears throat> there's there's something sad about it and so I I had always um, been <clears throat> sort of mechanically inclined, and I'll explain that later on in the video, but I uh, I was like, well, the heck with that. I guess I gotta learn how to do stuff, even if though I, did, I, I didn't have a lift, which I'm hoping to uh, get out of and get, you know, be able to get one. And so this is for, your, for everybody out there who wants to preserve knowledge, who wants to preserve memory, and wants to preserve and ride around in the things that were made when America was great because our cars are not as great as they used to be. <clears throat> so, we could have a long discussion about that, of course. You know, they are more efficient, perhaps, but they're, um, they're, they're cars that we've lost our knowledge in and we've turned over our lives, so to speak, to experts who... Uh, know how to work on them or have the time to work on them or just replace the parts well what happens when you want to fix the parts now that's what we're here for we're here to preserve memory preserve knowledge and preserve maybe a better way of doing things that's why we're american savage garage david lee roth he's got a big ego we gotta shut him off and uh this turned out pretty well Got a crap right here, though. Gonna have to fix that. And now, of course, this is the one I prepped yesterday. And we gotta lay um, a fiberglass resin in here. So these normally would be thrown away by people. And I'm kind of hoping that that doesn't happen anymore. Um, part of the stuff that we do here that I learned when I was uh, restoring my Ford my 1984 is that these pieces are hard to find. Uh, pieces like this are hard to find. And if you can't find them, they're very expensive. So what you need to do is repair them. And you don't need to really throw, throw them away. You can, uh, you can reuse them and save yourself a shit ton of money uh, if you know how to do it. And so, you know, if uh, stuff like this, um, you want to, uh, repair instead of you know spend an upwards of 500 bucks or who knows how much these pieces go for when they were brand new probably 100 bucks or more um, you can't find these anymore but you can find some things and they're hundreds of dollars so why not um, why not just pay me you know something far less and uh, get it repaired for you and you'll have something stronger in the in the long run so what we're going to do is we're going to do these two cracks here, um, the crack right here. It's pretty, pretty hairline, but I'm going to do it anyway so it doesn't crack any further. And then the crack 
right here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do the first, first we're going to do the long one and then we'll do the other one. So let me change this down here. And, uh, we'll get started. It's kind of hard to see, I think, perhaps. But you can probably get an idea. Okay, um, the resin should be started to thicken up a little bit, harden up. I got the hardener in there. Another nice warm 100, 100 degree day. As, uh, oh my gosh, look at that. It's Lemmy and Motorhead. So uh, this piece gets done to Motorhead. That's fun. There's a part of this here I'm just gonna have I'm just gonna resin it. I mean I might be able to get some fiberglass imp down in there, but if I can't, no big deal. Alright. Okay. Fiberglass. Just tap it in. As uh, as Lemmy eats the rich. Lemmy's a good Lemmy knows how to eat the rich, man. I'm gonna go ahead, I've got a little spot to do it here. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put some fiberglass in there on that end when that, of that crack, cause it sort of wraps around, so. I'm gonna need my bottle to hold this up, cause it does kind of run just a little, and I wanna prevent that. I don't wanna have to do a lot of uh, dremeling to clean it up. I think this one here is going to be pretty well done. It's just got a set up now, and we're going to move on to the other one. Okay, so I'm going to set this aside. Bring in the other one. This one's going to sit for most of the afternoon right there. Now this one's a hairline crack. Let me spread it just a little bit right there. I didn't realize it until this morning. So I already acetoned this baby up, and uh, just gonna put a little patch in there. Oh, I'm gonna need to cut another piece of fiberglass for this one. All right. All right. Now what's going to happen, um, this is not um, the be all end all of these. I've got two tabs to replace on these two that I'm going to do, even though I'm not going to use them. I want these things to be ready to be put into use should it should it ever come a need to. And I'm not going to spray paint it the color of mine because, you know, you never know. You might change your mind about the interior one day. And... Um, You know, I want to keep it as things as close to stock and not have to do things twice. So that's why that's why I'm doing the patching now while I have everything have everything out. And this one here can probably just lay here kind of flat. So what'll happen is what I'll do is after I'm done with this, I'm gonna turn them over and I'm gonna use a, like a glazing putty and uh, to fill in the cracks and then sand it down. And then those things, these things will be ready to be uh, sanded, prepped, shot, with paint, whatever, after it's done. It's really not that, um, that complicated of a process, but it, it does take time to do because right now this is going to have to sit for the rest of the day undisturbed and for you know a normal person who's got a job and whatnot I mean I do too but we kind of like to not have to, not have that job anymore if you know what I mean um, you know you go you go where you have your talent and this is this is mine uh, that I learned when I was um, Young, young teenager working on cars in the country. And uh, now I don't live in the country. I live in a, uh, what you call an HOA. And uh, I can't wait to get the hell out of here. But, <laughs> so, 
Anyway, we're moving on to the interior. Um, I'm, next thing I'm probably going to do is, you know, look at the upholstery and whatnot. Uh, but I wanted this video to be like the intro video to what we do here. Uh, so you can get an idea. I mean, I do more than that. I, um, my Harley, I rebuilt the transmission and the clutch and uh, changed all the oil hoses and the oil lines out, did the brakes, rewired the whole thing uh, on my 88 Harley. Um, and then uh, when I got the 1984, I did uh, the front end, pulled the axles, uh, shafts, stubs, um, did the uh, did the bearings on it, on the front wheels, did the rear wheels, did the rear brakes, um, did the brake lines, did the parking brake lines, and then I restored, started to restore the interior. Um, changed out the, uh, I didn't do much on the engine because the engine is, uh, and I don't have the capability here to be honest with you too pull an engine until I get my own shop up and running um, or remove which you know we'd love to do you know find some place away from uh, prying neighbors um, and some respect for them too because you know who wants to live next to a shop where um, you uh, you hear loud noises all day long or at least that's the way it was when I first got my Ford so I basically I had to cut tons of metal out the bad uh, welding in new metal bodywork a lot of sanding, repainting, priming, repainting of, uh, of the Ford. That's the first thing I did when I got it, is I did the body work. So, um, all of that sort of stuff, you know, we do here. And, uh, you know, I'd love to make it someday where we can actually have uh, a few talented, great people uh, to, work, to work here as well, you know, sort of get them uh, get them in the jobs that they find fulfilling that are actually uh, conducive to doing things which is especially true for guys I think anyway that's sort of that's sort of the theory that um, men should be doing this stuff um, because they have a natural aptitude and talent for it not that women can't but Usually you find most men in these kind, kind of trades and, um, you know, um, I've said this before in one of my videos, but someone asked me, oh, this, this was an academic, so I used to be an academic, so somebody asked me, what do you do, what the, <laughs> what do you do when you, when you do this? And I said, well, you know, I think of Socrates. Well, what the heck does that mean? You know, people who think and who we look up to and admire uh, at least uh, sort of the old school academics, they were, you know, they read Plato. They read they read the dialogues of Socrates. Sorry, this is keep the sweat from falling in my eyes. And uh, Socrates spent most of his life working for the city of Athens. He worked with his hands. He built ramparts and invasions. And it was only at the end of his life that he really when he couldn't, you know, do real physical manual labor anymore, at least the time, the kind of labor that he did in the army, um, that he began to have banquets, talk to people about uh, the nature of the good, philosophizing, you know, deep ideas. And how was he able to get the people who surrounded him, uh, whom he called, you know, his friends or his interlocutors, into private conversations about what life is all about, what uh, what is the right way to live, what is the nature of nature. And that was because he had the skills and the community around him that he did all of his life, and labored and developed real skills with his hands. And he had respect from them. He did more than just sit around all day um, now he did that too, don't we all? We all read books, we all, you know, have opinions about matters, politics, life, family, our neighbors. But Socrates gained his following, if you will, because he knew how to do more than just sit around and think all day. And that's what people should do to be productive. You gain, you gain respect from others. 
you uh, have some sort of basis to have a common communication. But I would say that for men, doing things like this, helping others, building things, is what we call creating own space. And today, if I can be slightly political, men have, uh, families have less own space. They're more reliant on others. And let's say the food chain dies. You know, one thing about these GoPros, man, they're <laughs> damn batteries don't last very long. Basically, the argument picking up where I left off is, if you uh, want to have own space, then you need to learn how to do things yourself. And then there may come a time when you need to do that. And we owe it, you owe it to yourself and your family to do things like that. And so that's what started me on this. I mean, I kind of like doing this stuff anyway. I did it as a teenager, you know. I went to a shop in Oregon, and I'm one of my good friends owned a shop, owned a garage. And, uh, you know, I hung around down there. We were always involved in, in uh, doing automotive things. So, um, you know, but I did more than that, man. I planted... Uh, gardens, raised cows, and lived on a farm. So we know how to do a ton of things. And if you don't know how to do things on your own, then you're really, to be honest with you, you're gonna be a slave to someone else. Especially in this day and age when they don't like this kind of labor. They don't teach it anymore. Um, they want you to sit behind a computer in a cubicle all day, you know? And I think especially for for men, um, you know, it's, uh, it's fake and gay. Um, as uh, some of my friends uh, say online. <laughs> so don't be faking gay. You know, learn how to do stuff and uh, fix your own things. And if you can't fix it, bring it to me. And I'll fix it for you. And you can keep those things that you should keep and not throw them away. Um, because things um, today are throwaway, including our cars. And the last thing you want to do is throw away an old, good car that will always run. Whereas cars today, they can be shut off, remote switch someplace. Tesla, you're driving down the road. Tesla can do this, by the way. They can shut your car off remotely, and you can't do nothing. Nothing about it. Uh, but these old cars, my old Harley, my old Ford, um, as long as you maintain them, uh, they, they will run. And uh, there's no one who can control your movements and control where you can go and when you can go there. So, you know, create own space. Come to American Savage Garage. All right. Still a delicious, crispy smell after the race. It's not your tailpipe. It's a little bit of shake and then bake. Shake and bake. That's our big time. Get used to hearing it. If you want